host, Elizabeth Hernandez, and today we will be focusing on diversity. For today's show, we will be talking about Islamophobia, and we will also be talking about the Black Lives Matter movement. And we'll be talking about how to promote this through things such as art and etc. And stay tuned after this commercial. take the trash out of the buildings and put it in the garbage truck. In there, the chute is way up high on the wall where the trash comes out into the bucket. And you have to take a big iron hook, reach up and hook the trash, and then it's falling down towards you. It's not a boring job. It's, a, you know, you can get out and talk. We're always finding something <laughs> very interesting. I mean, you never know what you're going to find in the trash. <laughs> I like my job very much. Welcome. We are back with um, Dion Dornell. Hi. So can you introduce um, our viewers about you? Yeah. Um, I'm a senior. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm studying business management, and I'm excited to graduate. Okay. Um, so there's been a topic about police brutality. Um, so can you discuss a little bit about it? Yeah. Um, for police brutality, it kind of kind of the origin of it started in slavery where um, slaves were used to be captured and um, they were called, they were basically slave catchers, the masters and whatnot would uh, police the slaves and then it, you go into segregation where um, blacks were, they were peacefully protesting and then they would get um, abused or hurt and arrested for no reason. And now today you have um, black or police officers using excessive force to contain blacks, um, and that's kind of what the, the Black Lives Matter movement is kind of a movement to bring awareness to these injustices and also um, systematic racism and systematic oppression. And it's also not just to marginalize a group per se, but kind of focus on the subject at hand. And with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, in your opinion, mm -hmm. do you think they're doing a good job promoting this and just elaborating on their point? Um, I do. I feel like the Black Lives Matter movement is doing an exceptional job. It's not you know, down to just one person. It's a group of people who are coming together to raise awareness of injustices done to, minorities, to minority people or students on campuses and, and classrooms. Um, so I feel as though the message is getting across as well um, how people are perceiving the message is a totally different subject because people are taking this to heart or, you know, they're coming up with um, the reverse of all lives matter or blue lives matter. But like I said, it's not to marginalize a certain group and focus on just, you know, black lives. I mean, I mean I've seen the hashtag used for white people who have been arrested or abused under um, police use. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's definitely something that's bringing being brought aware. Mm -hmm. And personally, how do you feel about this? Um, personally, I'm all for the movement. I'm strong about it. Uh, I hold it dear to my heart because I do have a younger brother who uh, will be 12 this year, and he has absolutely no idea the type of you know stereotypes that's held against him. You know what people look at when they see him, and I kind of have to be like, no, you can't just walk around in a store by yourself. Like that's not acceptable. You know, especially if there's a cop there. You know, I need you by my side. And um, just being a black woman, definitely, um, I'm looked at as weak or ugly because of the content of my skin color. Um, so it's just, it, it's personal to me. And then I, my boyfriend's white, so I bring awareness to it to him. And then he educate his coworkers. Oh, wow. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, we'll be returning back with you after this commercial. Welcome back. We are back with uh, Dion. Um, so, there are some, in your opinion, um, what are some things non black individuals could do um, about this issue? Okay. Um, when you speak of like non 
black or non of color individuals, I'm thinking of not the minority. So um, like our white colleagues or our white friends and family members, I would say use your white privilege to um, educate yourself and others around you to further the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. Also, if you are for the movement, kind of act on that. So, you know, don't, you know, silence is saying you're accepting this. So, you know, if you're not silent, then also, you know, continue to protest, you know, with your peers or continue to support them. You know, you may not know what they're going through, but you can mm -hmm. empathize with them instead of sympathize with them. Right. And you spoke about your boyfriend and him mm -hmm. being white. So how has that, how has that journey been? Um, it's been a great one because he accepts me for my culture. He accepts my natural hair. He accepts, um, you know, how like the language barrier that we may have between each other. So and he's willing to learn. He's open to my culture, especially with my sorority and how we do things. Um, so he's open to the different behaviors that I have that are you know, kind of different from his. So he doesn't really see it as like a black white thing. He sees it as a culture. So he respects my culture. And then um, he works at Verizon here. So they, their employees sometimes racially profile people that come in and they've had one on one conversation where he's like, no, this is wrong and this is why. And he kind of tells them like, my girlfriend has gone through this. So, mm -hmm. you know, he can empathize with me and then let them know. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, thank you for being on the show as well. Yeah. Um, we'll be um, going into our field reporter, Sylvia, so stay tuned. So when I say Isam Baksa, you just clap. Is that cool? Mm -hmm. Isam Baksa! Isam Baksa! Isam Baksa! I'm so easy. I come to crime, this crime. Soluble tears imprinted on the lines of notebook pages in my lover's cotton sleeves. See the rubble and weight that this body, this container holds. It includes my mama's voice. Her clock runs by overtime shifts. The current warning of her birthplace, the Filipinas cannot enter her mind. You see, she, she doesn't have the time. Besides, she sent the withered money in Manila envelopes. She sent the used shoes and, and brand name clothing for Familia back home. And who was it that said that in America, you're rich, rich, rich. <laughs> Whoever made such a lie hasn't felt the burden on the skin. Brown person limited to manual labor, factory blue collar hours, spitting out their happiness, spitting out their happiness in spite of the poet or thinker parts of you, day in, day out. Whoever made such a lie hasn't felt the burden on the skin as the one brown person to white eyes at an all white academy. so that the lawyer helps you dig out the rooms of your home from underneath your nails, cut your threads, uh, pledge allegiance to the flag, and when you cannot, each thread will cut through every inch of you to teach you that your kind was not meant for this country. Daddy told you that they will measure your success based on how smart you could be, so you tried to be smart. Books after books, you chase vocabulary for value, legislation to give you meaning. Yes, sir, I am a skilled worker. Yes, sir, I can contribute. No, sir, I haven't committed any crimes. Pinned against one another, you remember that your mother almost didn't make it through the border or any legislation this time around. 
She will make it into healthcare packages. She will be remembered during press conference. She will be dissected and research and research and research and research and research about how much she doesn't belong will be published. They don't tell you this when you migrate. I know. Wow. Trigger warning, rape, murder, America. There is the cinch of burnt flesh, the wail of family, the tears of the unborn, the smell of blood rivers. There is the noose, there is the whip, there is tar, there is the flame, there is stolen land, genocide. There are hidden bones, there is a flag waving its sins in our faces. There are countless dead who never have a headline. There is a days of rage, there is the smell of gun smoke, there is the gag of spilled oil, there is a mockery of freedom, there is the masquerade of equality, there is the sound of liberation being strangled, there is white supremacy being itself triumphant. Welcome back. Um, joining us, we have Lisa Misagaido, and she is a professor here at MSU. Um, can you tell our viewers a little bit about you? Sure. Um, I'm a professor in the Department of Art and Design, and I teach uh, three-dimensional foundation and the visual art capstone class. Uh, myself, I'm a Cuban-American. My parents came to the United States as Cuban exiles, um, as political exiles, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm an artist as well. Okay. So with this topic of immigration, um, how have you been able to promote that? Uh, well, my work in general has been, uh, I mean, I work in many different ways, but for multiple decades, I've tried to work out ideas uh, about my background, including immigration. That's one aspect uh, over multiple decades. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, in my undergraduate years, I visited uh, Ecuador and Chile, so I did work um, that dealt with colonialism uh, through art, using art as a way to kind of address these things. Um, and then in the 90s, I decided I wanted to address the artwork um, that addressed that. Um, I also created work that was more about migration to mm -hmm. kind of demonstrate the idea that people come from many different places, maybe not recently. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did a body of work where I did self-portraits, but instead of being like a face, it was um, researching the countries that their family, their heritage, cultural her heritage, and then creating uh, floral patterns based on plants from those countries. So they had unique kind of self-portraits self um, from anywhere from Ireland to Jamaica, um, mm -hmm. Colombia, just to name a few examples. Okay. So how did this idea come about for the topic of immigration? Um, what were you inspired by? Uh, for me, it was a time period where I was away from my family for the first time, and we're very close. Uh, we spoke Spanish at home. Um, and I was in graduate school, and I realized that there were issues I also hadn't dealt with growing up. Um, and so, because uh, I, for example, my sisters and I were like the only Latinas in uh, elementary and middle school. Uh, and so for me, I kind of looked to the history and started to create work about the immigration. So I interviewed family members and used videotapes or created pieces in response to that. Okay, well thank you so much. We'll be right back with you and stay tuned. Ah, oh, there they are.
perfect. Here at Provisions On Demand, we have everything you need right here on campus. We are open anytime you need to stop by. Conveniently located on the lobby floor of Alumni Tower. Welcome back. Um, we're back with Lisa. Um, so how has your work um, maybe promoted social change? Uh, well, I think the topics that I address, uh, they're cathartic for me. They've been cathartic, but they're also a form of education so that people can learn about individuals, immigration, um, mm -hmm. that's maybe a little bit different from what they may have learned in other uh, realms. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also have pursued social change or drawing attention to things besides immigration. So for example, in 2011, I actually went to Cuba with my family mm -hmm. uh, for the first time. And when I came back, I did work as a result of what I had seen there, mm -hmm. um, which dealt with um, the lack of uh, pharmaceuticals, commodities, uh, as well as food items and people bringing those items in to help individuals who, who were in need in the country. Okay. Um, and have you seen this um, captured by your students as well? Uh, well, my students are given an assignment in a 3D foundation class where they're supposed to research um, a topic of their, of, of their choice that's of interest to them and then create work as a, as a response. So some students have chosen to do uh, work that has to do with social change. Uh, several students last semester, for example, addressed sexual assault, especially on a campus, um, because of all the news stories that we've been hearing. Uh, we, I've had students uh, address social inequality or social economic inequality in their work as well, or health, uh, mental health issues. Um, it just depends on the student and what they're passionate about um, mm -hmm. in terms of creating artwork in response to these topics. Okay. Well, thank you so much, You're and welcome. thank you for sharing your work. It's great. Thank you I for really having me here. Thank you. Um, next up, we'll be talking to one of our students about Islamophobia. Um, stay tuned after this commercial. Welcome back. We are here with Dina Hassan. Um, please tell us a little bit about you and where you're from. Um, well, I'm from Moorhead, Kentucky. I've been here since I was in kindergarten. Um, I'm a biomed major and I'm an incoming freshman. Okay. Um, so where are you from, like your culture? Well, my parents both uh, were born and raised in uh, Egypt, Alexandria, Egypt. So they moved here whenever they were probably like around 20 when they were just starting col after college. So I've been here ever since then, but I've like grown up like with my like Egyptian culture and that part of me. And how has that been growing up with a diverse background? Well, um, I, I love it. It's pretty awesome because I feel like I get to experience like two different worlds. Um, it does have a lot of um, pros and cons to it. I mean, there's a lot of hardships being like here and being different because no one, uh, some people don't really understand what you're like mm -hmm. doing or like why you're doing what you're doing. But I mean, whenever you explain it to them, it gets, it gets easier. Does that happen a lot where you have to explain? Yeah, that happens a lot, um, very often. Mm -hmm. But like, so as I said, like I've been here, more has pretty small. So mm -hmm. like, like once you get to know someone, you like know them for a long time. So everyone kind of knows who I am and why I, like I am the way I am. And so it's been easier. Like at first, it's like questions, but I mean, they all know by now. And what are some traditions and ho or holidays that you um, celebrate? Well, with my religion, we celebrate um, Eid 
and Ramadan. We um, Ramadan is like a month where we fast. It's like you can't eat or drink from sundown to sunset. So you can't you can't eat anything or drink anything until the sun uh, goes down. And you do this for one whole month. And then at the very last day, the next day is when we have Eid, and it's like where we celebrate mm -hmm. the feast. And then we have another Eid. One's oh. Eid al Fitr and Eid al Adha. And that's okay. like after the pilgrimage is over in Saudi Arabia. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, we'll be right back with this topic after this commercial. <laughs> Welcome back. We are with Dina. Um, so, have you ever felt out of place? Um, yes, quite often I have felt like I was different and I felt like I didn't really belong. But when I surround myself with certain people, I tend to forget that I am different and I just feel like I'm a part of the crowd, which is good. Um, and with this, how have you felt about Islamophobia? Um, I do feel like Islamophobia is a very serious thing. Um, I feel like it is growing, but at the same time as I feel like it is decreasing, it really just depends on where you are. I feel like growing up and being in Moorhead, like even on campus, I really haven't felt any racial diversity. Like I haven't felt like anyone was like attacking me or saying mm -hmm. anything racist about me. But um, I do feel like it is a thing for other people in other places where there is a lot more racism going on, but I feel like here it isn't as bad. So how would you, what would you tell someone who's going through the same thing? Um, well, I do feel like people need to start uh, speaking up and talking because I feel like people tend to just um, get taken by racism and they won't do anything about it except for maybe complain about it, which I understand why they're complaining, but I feel like people need a voice and people need to explain and tell them why, why, what they are doing and what, like for the reasons they're doing it and they need to speak up about it so people understand. Mm -hmm. And has that been a little new to you, just having to explain why? Yeah, I mean, I like, it, w it was very, like, it taken back by it whenever I first started explaining it to people, but I feel like I'm so used to it by now, and I, I actually like explaining it to people because I like people to understand who I am, where I come from, and the reasons I do what I do. And I mean, it lets them understand what I'm doing, and it opens up their minds, and then it, it makes it so much better, honestly. That's why I feel like I haven't dealt with racism, because when I get an, like, an opportunity to talk to someone, they get to understand who I am, and they mm -hmm. realize that I'm not really one to be afraid of. Right. And with your parents, how has that been, just seeing you grow up and you having to experience this? Um, I feel like for them, they don't um, understand exactly what, I, like, I feel like they do in a certain point, but they also don't, where they, where they grew up in Egypt and they, they didn't really have to go through this racism and the racial profiling of people. They've been with the same type of people as they are. Mm -hmm. But I feel like it's hard for them to comprehend what me and I have a little sister are going through. But um, I feel like they really do try. And I mean, at some points they also get it because they're also here and they're also different. But like where I grew up here and I'm like growing up as a child, I feel like we get different racism. Like, and I'm a child, like even my sister who gets racism, like what is she supposed to do about it? She's a child, she can't comprehend what is going on unlike my parents who are adults. So I feel like it's hard for them at the same time. I don't think they fully get it, but I understand that they are trying and they also get it. Well, that's really great to hear. Thank you for sharing your story and your input. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you uh, viewers for watching and um, this is it for tonight. Thank you for watching. <laughs>
opportunity to use my platform and my privilege to speak out against the injustice that African Americans still face today. While Hall Johnson's mission to boost the Negro spiritual to new heights, the responsibility to share the stories of African Americans do not lie solely on him. We as Americans and as human beings of every color have the responsibility to speak up when we see and hear violence and injustice. Through the journey of this research fellowship, which has taken place over the last year, a multitude of men and women have lost their lives as a result of senseless gun violence and a system of institutionalized racism. I pray as an artist that the light of music that served African Americans for so long will continue to be a beacon of hope for the injustice that still occurs today. The fight is not over. Right on King Jesus, which is the finale to this recital, has served as a reminder of love and joy throughout my research and on days when I felt frustrated and like giving up. I hope that it will do the same for you tonight. Thank you.